Hi there, welcome to the uh, Veterinary Technician Online Review Course and um, for Maritime Business College. And we are moving on to, um, at this point, I'm not sure if the, the chapters or the, um, the modules are getting mixed up at this point, but nonetheless, uh, we are in the Laboratory Sciences section under 3.2, where we're gonna be covering microbiology, parasitology, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So let's get started on clinical microbiology. So microbiology is a study of microscopic, uh, microscopic organisms, so organisms that aren't able to be seen by the naked eye. Vets look to clinical microbiology labs to rapidly provide information about the presence of bacteria, funguses, and viruses in a patient sample. Okay, so a sample that's collected by a patient, we need to know exactly what kind of microorganism is living in it, whether it's a bacteria, fungus, or a virus. Microbiological diagnostics will also aid the veterinarian in determining the proper treatment. So depending on what kind of microorganism it is, we can treat it specifically, right? So the veterinary technician's role in microbiology is typically sample collection, proper handling and labeling of the specimens, culturing and or sending culture samples away to the microbiological labs. So what kind of samples can we collect and send for analysis in a clinical setting? So what, within a, a typical clinic, what are the samples that we're gonna be sending away? And how cute is this monkey, right? He's got the answer, apparently. So sample collection, um, it's very important uh, that a good sample has to be collected by the veterinarian or the technician um, to get good microbiological culture results. So you have to have a good sample to get good results. So be very careful when collecting that sample. If, it, if sampling the skin, the mucous membrane, conjunctiva, respiratory tract, urogenital tract, or GI tract, you have to keep in mind that there's always gonna be some good bacteria that's present um, within all of these samples. There's good bacteria that lives there and that's gonna to be that has to be expected the culture will come back positive obviously we just need to figure out which one's the good bacteria and which one's the bad so whoever's running the test must be able to differentiate between the harmful pathogenic bacteria and the normal flora which is the normal bacteria that lives within these areas or it's also termed indigenous flora so they have to be able to differentiate between indigenous flora and harmful pathogenic organisms. So although indigenous flora are normally found in these areas, whether it be your skin, your mucous membrane, your GI tract, um, and they do have beneficial functions for a body, they serve a purpose, but they may become harmful under the right circumstances. So if if, for example, my immune system doesn't keep that indigenous flora in check and it starts duplicating and duplicating and multiplying and taking over, it can then become harmful. So thanks to my immune system, that doesn't happen and my indigenous flora just lives there and it's kept under control by my immune system and, and does very positive things for my body. But keep in mind that this indigenous flora, even though it's a positive thing, can become a negative thing. So good sample collection guidelines for microbiological microbiolo specimens. So when we are collecting these samples, we have to collect the, the specimen aseptically. So we have to avoid contamination from the normal flora. So we have to be careful with that kind of stuff. So for example, if you're collecting a sample off of the skin, you may want to aseptically clean that and make it aseptic before you take, um, take that sample. So do it early in disease as well. So do it before the antibiotics are used. They will interfere with isolation of pathogens. If the patient is already on antibiotics, collect the sample just before the next dose um, of antimicrobial um, because that concentration will be at its lowest. So for example, um, this, this typically arises in cases where there's uh, bladder infections. So if we're trying to send off a urine sample, trying to figure out exactly what kind of bacteria is growing in this bladder causing this issue, it's very important that we collect that urine sample before we start antibiotics, because obviously the antibiotics are gonna start destroying that pathogen, and that's obviously gonna make it very hard for us to be able to identify that pathogen. So, um, but there are are some cases that it already happened and we need to collect that sample and send it off no matter what whether they've started it or not so it's not ideal 
but what you're going to do is you're going to collect that sample right before their next dose. So that means that the antibiotic is going to be at a very low concentration within, within that patient. And then we'll collect our sample and hopefully we'll be able to get good results. We also have to make sure that we collect adequate amounts of sample. You may need to send not only a culture, but sometimes you need to send a slide. So make sure you have collected enough sample to do both of those. So there's nothing worse than collecting samples from a patient that needs to be sent off and then the patient leaves the building and then you realize you need more sample and it's very embarrassing having to call that owner back saying you know we made a mistake could you please come back it's inconvenient right and we don't want to do that so we have to make sure that we collect the proper amount of samples um, just in case we need a little bit more it's, it's never you can never have too it's better to have too much than to have too little that's that's what I always say anticoagulants can prevent bacterial growth as well so be careful which type you use when sending blood so if you are sending blood for a blood culture, just make sure that you do your research depending on the company that you're sending it to. Um, there are going to be special anticoagulants that you need to use so that it doesn't uh, prevent the bacterial growth. Um, it's important that when sending samples that you separate multiple samples that you're sending off because we don't want cross-contamination. We don't want our urine sample that we're sending off to mix in with our fecal sample because that's obviously going to give us inaccurate results with our urine sample. So within that one bag that we're sending all these samples in, make sure that all of these samples are separated really well. And it's also very important that each one of those samples be properly labeled. It seems like an obvious thing that you would obviously put that information on it, but one of the biggest issues that comes that external labs have with um, clinics sending them samples is labeling. It's unbelievable how many people forget to label and or or improperly label. So you have to make sure that you have the patient name, the client name, phone number, contact, the clinic that you're sending it from, what kind of sample you're sending, when it was collected, how it was collected, as much information that you could possibly fit on that label, put it all on there. It's better to have too much. So multiple samples submitted each need to be labeled from where the sample was came from, for example, like what I said, you know, where it came from, when, what the patient is, who the patient is, and all that stuff. Um, you have to keep the specimens cool during transport. So a lot of, for example, urine and stuff, they need to be refrigerated, but when they're during transport, you, can, uh, you can't have that. So it's very important to place an ice pack within that transport bag so that things stay cool. Um, because if things warm up to room temperature or even hotter, things will start degenerating and we'll get false results, okay? Um, if you're sending a sample that has liquid in it, um, typically that's urine or even formalin, you have to make sure that the container is perfectly sealed so that there's no leakage. Um, typically, to be extra cautious, you tighten the container, tape the container, put it in a Ziploc bag, and put that Ziploc bag in another Ziploc bag, and that'll avoid contaminating any other samples that are in there if it does leak. And uh, send to reference lab by the fastest means possible. Most places that um, that you're sending your stuff to, it needs to it typically gets there within 12 to 24 hours, and that's all, that's that's ultimately what we want. We need these samples to be processed as soon as, soon as possible because the longer they sit, the longer they sit, things are going to start degenerating or even things, for example, crystals in urine may start forming when they're not really there. Um, bacteria, all of these things are all um, affected by the length of time as, the, as time goes by. So we have to make sure that it gets processed as quick as possible. So uh, we keep talking about these samples that we're sending off, but what are these samples that we're sending off? We already mentioned a few of them, for example, urine to be sent off. We mentioned blood to be sent off and feces as well. Um, Sometimes we send washes of infected sites. So for example, a, a transtracheal wash or a bronchi bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, for example, what's going on in this, uh, this horse right here, they're doing a tracheal wash. So um, they suspect that there's some kind of infection going on in that trachea um, or some kind of disease process is happening. So they're gonna flush some saline in there and then suck it back out um, to suck in all the pathogens in with that sample. And they're gonna send that sample off so that we can identify that pathogen. We often send tissue uh, like biopsies or necropsy specimens, so pieces of livers, pieces, pieces of kidneys, different pieces of different organs that we may want to collect during necropsy, and um, those tissues are usually soaked in formalin, and um, which, which stops the tissue from, from dying 
as it would normally do so. Um, and another example is swabs. Sometimes uh, in infected swabs or ears or um, sorry, infected sites like ears or, or wounds or anything like that, we may do a swab and send that swab off to see what's growing in there. So let's talk about each one of these samples. A urine sample, uh, you need at least half of a mil. It's better to have more than not enough. So at least half a mil is not a lot. A lot of owners come in thinking that they need to bring us a whole bucket of urine when really all we need is just a couple cc's and we're good. Uh, minimally, we need 0.5 mils. Cystocentesis is the best way to collect a urine sample if we're sending it off for analysis because uh, cystocentesis will give us the most sterile urine. It's the urine taken directly from the bladder. There's been no contamination from the floor or even from the prepuce of the male dog or the vulva of the female. Um, all of those contain contaminants and it can contaminate our samples. So cystocentesis directly out of the bladder is the best. Um, if you do collect a free catch, um, you have to do it midstream. So um, any dirt on the vulva or on the prepuce can get expelled right at the beginning of the urination and then midstream hopefully Hopefully it'll be a little bit cleaner. And um, it's very important to make a notation of what your collection method was so that the person running the test can be aware whether there is going to be contamination or not. For blood samples being sent off, um, it's used when an animal typically has a systemic infection. So there's an infection going on throughout the whole body. We need to know what pathogen that is and we'll send off a blood sample for a blood culture. So we need multiple cultures because of transit, transient bacteremia. So this is bac bacteria may not be present at all times. So depending on when you take your sample and where you take your sample, you may not have bacteria present in that exact location and sample that you collected. So you do when doing blood cultures you need to have multiple samples to make sure that you do catch that bacteria. Typically we do three samples um, collected a minimum of 30 minutes apart and collected from different veins as well. Again because the circulatory system is constantly moving right so the bacteremia is, is going to be different um, or in different locations throughout the circulatory system potentially. Um, aseptically clean the skin area where you will do your veiny puncture. Again, that's just reducing contamination. Do not use EDTA and heparin. We, we mentioned this a few slides back that the anticoagulants can affect the, um, the bacterial growth. So we don't use EDTA and heparin, so purple top tube or green top tubes. We actually use a yellow top tube like in this picture right here. It has a certain anticoagulant that's um, labeled as SPS. I can't say that I know what that stands for, but SPS is the anticoagulant within this yellow top tube and that is the one that we use for blood cultures. Fecal samples. So when sending fecal samples, you need at least one to 10 grams of fresh feces in a clean container. And that's not a lot. Again, a lot just like urine, when people bring us in buckets of urine, um, a lot of owners will bring us a whole Sobeys bag with a very large amount of feces and we don't need that much. Uh, we just need about one to 10 grams of fresh feces and it needs to be placed into a clean container again to avoid contamination. Even though feces is quite contaminated in itself, we need to be sure that we're not adding contamination, which may give us false results. And it's very important that it's refrigerated and placed on ice for transport, just like most samples anyways. A wash sample, whether it's a transtracheal uh, wash or a bronchoalveolar wash, these are fluids that were re-aspirated from a location and we need about half a cc, so not very much. Half a cc is to be placed into um, a sealed container and we also have to ship this refrigerated. As far as tissue samples go, they, they can be collected aseptically during surgery. So for example, if we're doing surgery, even just a simple spay, we can be in the abdominal cavity and say, hmm, look at that liver. It looks quite funny, doesn't it? Very abnormal. So they may choose to take a little tiny chunk of that liver and send it off um, to a histologist to see what's going on with that liver. You have to place this sample in a sterile container to ship. Typically it's soaked in uh, formalin, which is a diluted formaldehyde. So you can also do a biopsy. So you can place this sample again in a sterile container and ship it away. We all know what biopsies are when we um, take a slice of tissue. Biopsies can be um, 
collected in different methods. Typically biopsies are either you take a scalpel blade and cut off a small piece of the area that you're concerned about, or you can also use the um, the biopsy pen. Uh, you you it has a very sharp scalpel blade type circular tip that will take out a chunk for you of the location. And you can also send biopsy or tissue samples during necropsy. And uh, you should it, the the sample itself should contain the lesion, so the concerning area, and it should be large to give them enough sample to analyze. Swab samples. So we always use a sterile swab. Again, the whole key to all of this is to reduce contamination. The least suitable method, um, we, um, people that are in these reference lab would prefer having the sample itself as opposed to a swab of the sample, but nonetheless, it's still done. Contamination is a high risk, hence why it's not a suitable method. Cotton can inhibit microbial growth, so the microorganisms may, be, uh, may not grow as well because of the cotton. And uh, if delay is expected, you can use a culturette. So you actually take um, the media and place the whatever you swab directly on the media and send the media off itself. That is another option as well. So now that we know what samples we're collecting and how to properly co collect them, what are we going to do with these samples? So sample processing, several processing techniques can be done with collected samples, either in clinic or through an external lab. So samples can be feces, exudate, milk, urine, blood, and other bodily fluids. So um, here, there, there are some extra examples here of type of um, certain things and samples that we would send off to external labs. Nonetheless, there's a whole variety of samples that we can take and a whole variety of testing that we can do on them. So we could do microscopic examination. We could do a gram staining, acid fast staining. We could do a culture. And we can also do a culture and sensitivity. And we're going to go through all five of these steps. So microscopic examination. You can examine exudate. And exudate is just fluid emitted by an organism through pores or a wound. So anything that's going to be leaking out of a wound uh, or pores or anything like that, that's called exudate. So we could examine that microscopically. We could examine materials from a draining tract in a patient. We could examine thoracic fluid. These are all different types of things that we could examine microscopically. Obviously, there's a whole bunch more, but these are just examples. And uh, it's important that you prepare several slides because you're going to have slide to slide variations. So you should never just have one, especially if something goes wrong with that one and you drop it and break it, you always have, you always will have that backup one. So whether you're doing in-house microscopic examination or you're sending it to an external lab, just try to take several samples. So gram staining. So the most common staining technique used to identify bacteria in microbiology labs, it, it's the gram staining. So it uses different dyes to distinguish between bacterial cell walls, okay? So the bacteria is either going to be gram positive or it's going to be gram negative. So the gram positive bacterial cell wall is made up of poly, um, or sorry, peptid, peptid, peptidoglycan, and they stain purple. So any bacteria with this gram staining that stains purple is going to be a gram positive bacteria. The gram negative cell wall has a double lipid bilayer and that actually stains pink. So if we're using the gram staining and this bacteria shows up as pink, we know that it's a gram negative bacteria. So there could be presence of other cells, for example, white blood cells and so on. And uh, in typical small animal clinic setting, vet techs often use the right stain to look at all slides. So when we do a microscopic examination, we typically use a right stain. And this is not the stain that's going to be able to help you figure out if a bacteria is gram negative or gram positive. You need a gram stain, not a right stain. So don't get that confused. And there's a link here that you can watch uh, at your own leisure to see this gram staining process. Continuing on with gram staining, so um, you have to stain before you culture. Um, 
It helps you with rapid identification of the bacteria. It determines the appropriate medium to use because there's different types of agar plates that are going to work better for gram positive or gram negative bacteria. So if I have a gram negative bacteria, I know I'm going to use this agar plate or this culture plate because it's going to be able to grow better with this gram negative bacteria that I have. Also helps you determine the, the appropriate antibacterial. So depending whether it's gram negative or gram positive, different antibacterials affect those two different bacteria differently, right? Right. So this is uh, this is a chart here showing you differences on the top one. You can see uh, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, all these different types of gram positive bacteria that you may see, whether they're cocci or bacilli. Um, bacilli is the um, these ones right here that are rod shaped, whereas we have cocci here that. Um, that are round. And then down here you have your gram negative and, um, and it, there's a whole variety of different types of bacteria. This is uh, E. coli right here. Acid fast staining. It's also a very common technique used to identify bacteria. It's used to determine the identity of an organ organism, where um, whereas the gram staining just determined whether it was gram negative or positive, this acid fast staining actually will tell you what the organism is, the identity of the organism, not just whether it's gram negative or gram positive. So acid fast organisms stain bright pink to red, and non acid fast organisms will stain green. Cultures. Um, methods of multiplying or growing microbial organisms like bacteria and viruses by letting them reproduce in a culture media, which is like a petri dish or we call an agar plate. Okay, so we're taking the bacteria, we're putting it in a petri, excuse me, a petri dish or an agar plate or a culture media, and we're going to allow it to grow. Okay, so this is going to help us with identification. So it's used for determining the type of organism present in the sample, the amount of organism present in the sample, and the type of agar plate used depends on the sample and the suspected organism. Remember on the last slide we talked about certain agar plates are going to be used for gram negative and certain for gram positive and some don't matter. Uh, media used are made to prevent the growth of indigenous flora. Remember that's the healthy bacteria that's growing in our body that we don't, we're not trying to get rid of that one. It's the pathogenic ones that we want to get rid of and identify and allows the growth of the pathogen itself, not the indigenous flora. And the media can be liquid, it can be broth, it could be a plate. It could be a tube, so there's a wide variation. These are different uh, culture medias. We have our typical agar plate down here. Here's a tube here, and this is a liquid agar up here. So it can, this is probably the most common that you'll see, um, but there are various other ones. So now that we need to, now with cultures, we've determined what kind of culture plate we need. We need to inoculate it. So put the bacteria on the plate itself. We have to inspect the medium. So the, the actual substance, whether it's the gelatinous substance or whether it's the liquid, uh, we have to make sure to inspect it to be sure that it's not contaminated. So use permanent marker to write the date, patient name, on and the sample that you're collecting on that agar plate so that it doesn't get confused with any other and several streaking techniques can be done here is the quadrant streak technique which i do believe is the most common so you start at the top and then you move down so basically um, you're going to really concentrate all that bacteria here and then you're going to take a this is a loop here that's just a sterile loop and you're going to take it and you're actually going to be dragging down the bacteria that we did up here we're actually just dragging it down and, and that's going to thin out the bacteria a little bit and then we're going to continue on over oh sorry over here and then we're going to do a little tiny squiggle at the end so most of the bacteria that's going to be here is going to be able to be isolated so because we've stretched it out quite thin from here because up here there's going to be so much bacteria growing and they're in such huge colonies that there's not much we can do with it but we're spreading it out thinner and thinner and thinner so that we can isolate it and this here um, is the inoculation technique that we were just talking about. Once you've used this spreading technique and grow the bacteria for about 12 to 48 hours, it should look like this. If it's positive, of course. If it's negative, it'll just look like nothing. So this right here, you can see that um, the thickest part of our sample was right here. This is what we did first. Then we used our sterile loop and we spread it thinner. 
we spread it thinner and then we spread it thinner and thinner and you can see how there's these just these single little dots so we've isolated it here you can't see much because it's all growing in major colonies in here too um, but we we thin it out and streak it down and so that we can um, isolate it and this is specifically salmonella so always incubate upside down. When we take that plate and we incubate it for 12 to 48 hours, you need to, uh, to incubate it upside down because there is going to be moisture that's going to form at the top of that plate. And we can't have those moisture droplets dripping down into our agar plate because that's obviously going to ruin the growth or contaminate the growth. So just always flip it upside down so that the moisture doesn't affect the growth of the bacteria. You incubate it for about 12 to 48 hours and it, it typically gets incubated at 35 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius. And uh, it's important to inspect the plates at least once a day and the plate should be held and examined for three days before you actually throw it out and say, ah, oh, there's nothing there. Um, so if it, before calling it negative, you have to wait and give it three days for it to fully give it the opportunity to grow. And here's a website as well that you can watch just to show you that. So there are some safety factors. Some bacterial and fungal agents can be dangerous to handle because the cultured organism may be highly infectious. So you may choose not to culture in a private practice and you may just want to send to an external lab. So when you're taking, um, you know, a small amount of a virus and you're, you're inoculating it in a culture plate, you're actually growing it. So that there's like, there's thousands and thousands and millions and millions of the bacteria, whereas we just started with a small amount because we actually grew more of it so it can be quite dangerous so some places may just swab and send it off so that they don't have to worry about having these millions and millions of bacteria growing within their location so remember to stain first um, as far as the culture goes. So on slide 18 of this PowerPoint, we mentioned that staining before culturing. So it helps us with rapid identification, determines appropriate medium to use and determines appropriate antibacterials. So we need to know whether it's gram negative or gram positive first before we actually take that bacteria and smear it onto our agar plate. Um, you, can, you can now appreciate that knowing the type of bacteria and whether it's gram negative or positive and that will help us determine the type of agar plate. Um, and and impregnated discs to use and you'll understand what I what I mean by impregnated discs in a second we're going to talk about uh, the sensitivity part of the culture and sensitivity because now we know what a culture is but there's a sensitivity aspect of it and, and that's basically figuring out what kind of antimicrobial or antibiotic drug is going to kill that specific bacteria so if we've done the staining before we even cultured it we know that it's a gram negative or gram positive and let's say prescription a will kill a gram negative better than prescription B. So if we know it's a gram negative bacteria, we grow it. Now for a sensitivity test, we're going to choose drugs that are specific to gram negative because we know that it's gram negative. So uh, for example, blood agar grows gram negative and positive, but the McConkie agar only grows uh, gram negative. Certain antibiotics work better with gram negative and gram positive bacteria, like I said. So culture end sensitivity. Now that we've done our culture, it's testing to find out what specific bacteria is present. We need to do the sensitivity aspect, which is testing to find out which antimicrobial or antibiotic will kill this specific bacteria and which antibiotic will be ineffective at killing it. So it helps the vet determine the most appropriate, appropriate antibiotic use. So the impregnated discs that we mentioned before are these little tiny things here. I always refer to them as like um, hole punches. When you hole punch your piece of paper and the little round piece that falls out, that's exactly what this looks like. A little bit thicker and we actually um, impregnate it. So we drop some of the medication liquid form onto these little discs. So the discs, the discs soak up the medication and um, and then we place it on the agar plate and we continue with incubation to see how well it's going to kill all the bacteria that's growing on this plate here. So once you have the inoculated egg air plate, place small round paper discs um, that have been impregnated with different types of antibiotics, incubate for another 18 to 24 hours. Um, and the antibiotic kills that bacteria. You'll see a clear zone, and that's actually called the zone of inhibition um, around that disc. So in our lab manual, it does also talk about, it talks about uh, resistance and susceptibility zones of inhibition, but nonetheless, uh, the, it'll create that zone of inhibition if it's successfully killing off that bacteria. And then we'll know which drug is going to be better than the other.
So this right here is showing you uh, culture and sensitivity. Um, obviously, we're not going to want to go with whatever this drug was impregnated with. We may want to go with this one up here because that seems to be doing a really great job at killing off that bacteria. And there's a website here that you can watch at your own leisure.